This is our October version of First Wednesday 2018. And, and it's going to be, I, I just feel terrible because I'm going to have to follow. I was worried all week I going to have to follow Chad's message on Sunday morning. That was awesome. You know what? You don't have to have 30 minutes of preaching sent to you to get something that refreshes your soul. And he, and he had several one-liners Sunday that I was like, I'm, that's, I'm using that this week. That's me. And then I was sitting over here, and I was surrounded by a group of people who were preaching for Chad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on. I was ready to pack the chairs up and leave Sunday. It's like, let's get out of here. We're gone. I was excited. And so that vision that was cast, I like to know where we're going and why we're going. And, and some of the scriptures he brought in at the end was just awesome. So I was worried about following that anyway. And then the worship team comes up here and just welcomes Jesus in the house. And so I'm like, wow, wow, that is two amazing services back to back. And then you get me. So sorry, sorry about that. But tonight's message is titled 3 a.m. Hashtag I seen a ghost. Don't get scared. I know it's October. Don't get nervous. But it's 3 a.m. Now, I just want to take a quick poll, okay? How many of you have a habit of waking up at 3 a.m.? For some reason, there's just like, you feel like every time you wake up, it's 3 o'clock. It's like, why? This is just too weird. It's me, for sure. And what I've learned over the years is every time I wake up at 3 o'clock, I just get up. And I just start walking around. I'm like, okay, you know, if you want to tell me something, God, good. If you want to show me something, good. I'm here. I'm ready. I'm willing. Well, two years ago, 3 o'clock. I wake up, oh, all right, I've done this, I don't know, 10 times the last year, but I'm going to get up and walk around. As I, as I start down the stairs, I hear a shh, shh. I turn around and look, and the heater that my wife thinks she just has to have beside the shower so that when she, she shaves her legs, she doesn't have to do it again, was on fire in our bedroom. It was on fire at 3 a.m., and so I just said, God, thank you. Every time I wake up, I'll go check the bathroom. I'll see what's going on from now on. But here, I want to start this scripture. I want to set this up for you, okay? Jesus and the disciples, they've been working all day. They've been preaching in the heat. They've been ministering. They are tired. They are hungry. And one of the disciples says this, Jesus, let's go. I'm hungry. You're hungry. They're hungry. Let's go. It's 5 o'clock. And Jesus goes, now let's feed them. Ah, really? Ah, we only got five loaves and two fish, you know. We would, Jesus. And Jesus goes, no, no, feed them. And so they go back to work. Now, here, here's a new life word, okay? I want you to get this, okay? New life, a lot of hard work has went into getting us right here. And we've got an amazing, awesome facility, but it's not 5 o'clock. There's still work to do. Jesus is still working in us, through us. He's got something big for us. It's not 5 o'clock here at New Life. So what they did with five loaves and two fishes, they fed them. And then after they get through feeding, I'm guessing it's probably Peter, because he was the one always complaining. But somebody said, all right, we worked all day. Now we're hot, we're sweaty, we're fat, because we've ate all this food. Can we go now? And Jesus said, yeah, sure, let's, let's go Here's what I'll do. Y'all get in the boat. You go across the Sea of Galilee. I'm going to stay here and pray for a little while. And that's where I picked the story up. So in Mark 6, 47 through 51, late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake. And Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard, struggling against the wind and waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed. First thing, they were eating during the daytime, he says, in the afternoons, get in the boat, go across the sea. What time is it and they're still not across? Three o'clock. Maybe nine hours they've been out there rowing. 
Now, here's where it gets good. Here's where I want us to, to really dig into and ask yourself questions sometimes. Because when I first read this, I asked myself, whoa, 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 wait, let me get this right. All right, who told them to go out? Jesus. Who knew the storm was going to be there? Jesus. Who was continuing to watch them struggle? Jesus. Now, here's where, it get, here's where it gets really shady for Jesus. It says he came out there but intended to what? Walk on by, pass them by. So not only did he create all this trouble, he's just going to walk by like nothing happened. He's like, hey, I see you there. I see you. I asked myself when I read this story, what in the world is going on? What are you trying to do? Are you mad at them? Are you upset? Are you testing them? Jesus, what is going on here? I, I've got to know why you would do this to them. Because I don't want it to be me. I don't want it. Whatever they did, I don't want to do. And we're going we're gonna to look into that tonight. But first, you have to enter this message to understand it with this. It's not about us. We're a small piece of the puzzle in this huge plan that God has. And so sometimes it's not about us. And sometimes it's not what we did that put us where we are. It's because Jesus needs you there. Now listen to this. It's going to sound strange, but you may just be bait. You might just be bait. And you're like, really? What, did Jesus not say who, you'll be fishers of men? Did he not? So if he's going to fish for men, what's he going to fish for? Maybe fishing with you. Maybe you're in that terrible job, not for you, but for them. Maybe you're in that bad relationship, not because you did something, but because he needs you there for them. This could be for someone else, not for you. But to get this, you've got to enter and realize that it's not always about you. So when you get into a problem, you get into a situation, it's not always about you. So pull yourself out and go, what are you trying to get here, Jesus? What are you trying to prove here? And here's, what's, here's what I love about Scripture and what burns inside of me. And that is, the Old Testament can't live without the New Testament. The New Testament can't live without the Old Testament. You have to put them together. And it doesn't take, I'm no Bible scholar. I didn't graduate from any seminary. I just read this Bible front to back until it saturated my soul. And it's just a part of me now. And I just love it. And when, some, when I read something like this, and I go, wait, wait, wait. What are you trying to do here? I go, okay, wait, wait. Let's see if this has happened before somewhere. Let me think about this. This just, this, this just doesn't make sense. Let me see. That scripture that says you were going to pass them by, get on Google. And you Google on your computer pass them by and it pulls up all these scriptures you don't even have to look for it anymore it's just there you just ask them and one of the first ones in exodus now to set this up here's moses and moses has led israel out of egypt he's done everything god's asked him to do he's led them where he wanted to lead them he fed them when he wanted to feed them but now he's been talking to this ghost this burning bush this cloud by night and he's tired of just hearing a voice. He goes, God, I'll do it. I've been doing it. I want to see you. I want to see you, God. And here's what, here's what God told Moses. Exodus 33, 23. So it shall be. So I will. I'll let you see. While my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. While I pass by, I'm going to cover you and let you see some, but not all. So Jesus was not the first one that was going, I'm just passing by. No, God says, Moses, yeah, you can see me, but just a little. I'm just passing by. Do you want to know why? It's because Moses wasn't ready. God is saying, Moses, I would love to show you my face, but I'm too holy I'm too righteous, I'm too perfect, and if I look at you face to face, I'm going to be forced to judge you, and you'll die. I'll have no choice in the matter. You're just a human. You don't have that sacrifice yet to cover you, and if I look at you face to face, I'm sending you to hell. 
and I don't want to do that. I love you, Moses. You can see a little, but we can't look face to face. I'm going to just pass you by. So that's the first scripture. Why did Jesus intend to pass him by at 3 a.m. on the Galilean Sea? Well, Exodus says God passed him by because he was not ready. You're not ready. A little bit further on, it, there's another one in the story of Job. Maybe the oldest book in the story of Job. He's had a pretty rough patch. Most people know the, the story of Job. It's just been bad. He keeps preaching. It's bad. He keeps preaching. It gets worse. He keeps preaching. And his friends keep coming by and just give up, give up, give up. And this is what Job says. Job says he has seen this vision. Now, catch this. Job may be the oldest book. Exodus is way back there. Hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus is walking on the water about to pass that boat by. Way before people are seeing and saying things like this. Job says, he alone has spread out the heavens and what? Marches. On the ways of the sea, marches, walks on the sea. He alone can do that. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he moves by, I do not see him go. And God does not restrain his anger. Even the monsters of the sea are crushed beneath his feet. Job is saying thousands of years before, God walks on the water he controls the water. He controls everything. And I want to get to him, but what? He just passes me by. I want to talk to him and go, why am I going through this? Tell me, God, what's going on? But he just passes me by. And later on, Daniel says this. Daniel says that Daniel's seen dreams and visions all the time. Daniel wakes up in the morning and goes, guys, you're not going to believe this. Anybody else walk, wake up in the morning? And they've had a dream so real that you want to slap your spouse because they did something wrong? <laughs> hey, I woke up in the morning like, oh, wait, it was just a dream. She didn't really do that. Oh, all the guns are still over there. <laughs> Good for you, Tara. Sometimes those dreams feel real. And I get up in the morning, and my girls get up in the morning, you won't believe what I dreamed, Daddy. And they tell me all these dreams that usually come after we eat pizza. I don't know about you, but you eat pizza. We have these crazy dreams. But Daniel wakes up in the morning. Daniel wakes up and goes, hey, I had this dream, this vision last night. Check this out. I, this is hundreds of years before Jesus comes. Daniel says, I seen this priest, and Jesus is called the what? The high priest. I seen this priest dressed in white, just hovering over the water, just walking on the ocean. Isn't that crazy? I don't know what it means, but I'm going to write it down. I may need it later. Yeah, yeah, we're going to need it later. We sure are. We're going to need it later. So here's another version of pass you by, another version of Jesus on the water, another version of the Old Testament we could take and put into the New Testament. Now, I'm going to go back and tell you something right here. They're out on the water, and they're struggling, and they're trolling, and they're fighting. Things are not good. They're in a bad situation. They hate it. It stinks to them. And guess what? They're right where God wants them. So listen, just because you're fighting doesn't mean you're not where God wants you. Just because you're struggling doesn't mean that's not where God wants you. They were fighting and struggling right in the middle of God's will where he wanted them to be. Right in the middle. Now we're going to go into the last scripture and tie all this together. It's in the book of Amos. And Amos is one of those prophets. And Jesus, or God has just, just had it. He's told Israel, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And they continue to do it anyway. I used to think, how are they so stupid? That's got to be that he chose the stupidest people for his own. He's telling them not to do it, and they do it anyway. Then I grow up, and I go, dang it, me too. I'm doing it too. But Amos is there, and God says, Amos, won't you tell Israel, I've warned them, I've warned them, I've warned them, I've had it, I'm about to blow it up. I'm about to tear it up. They're going to wish they had not seen this. I'm coming. I'm bringing judgment. It's going to get ugly. And here's what it says. Check this out. In Amos 7, verse 8, the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line, the Lord. Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, a plumb line. 
level, straight, a line in the sand saying, I've had it. I'm drawing a line in the sand, and if, they don't, if they're not walking this line, it's over. I'm done with them. And he goes on to say, I've set this plumb line up, Amos, and I will not pass by them anymore. There will come a day that I will no longer just pass you by. There will come a day where I will no longer just provide, protect, and act like I didn't see it. God says, there's coming a day where I'm done passing by you, Moses, because you're not ready. I'm done, Daniel, just giving you visions and passing by because you're not ready. I'm done, Job, just passing by because you're not ready. I've told you and told you and told you. And God's telling Amos to tell us, there's going to come a day when I'm done passing you by. I'm going to stop. I'm going to look at you, and it's judgment day. You've had all your chances. This is it. Now, catch on to what's happened. God has passed by Moses. He's passed by Job. He's gave Daniel's visions of passing by. And he comes to Amos and goes, I'm done. There's going to come a day when I'm done passing people by. I'm done. And here's where it all comes together. And that is all the disciples in that boat, all those disciples at 3 a.m., they knew these stories. They knew the stories that I'm, that I'm telling you of Exodus and Moses that got passed by. They knew the stories of Job, and he was getting just beat down. But God says, I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to pass you by. They knew all these things. Not to mention, they knew Passover. Where God says, I'm about to wipe, it, wipe Egypt out, but I'm going to pass over you. I'm going to pass by you. I'm going to act like you're not what you really are, and I'm going to pass you by. They knew all this. So what happens on the sea is, and why are we in this trouble? Why have we been put out here? Why are we here? Why was he going about to walk by? Why was he intending to go by? Because the day had come. They knew the Scriptures. He knew they knew the Scriptures, and he intended to pass them by, knowing that when they cried out, he was going to get in that boat, and all of a sudden, he's not passing by anymore. God's not passing by anymore. And the disciples in that boat that knew those Old Testament scriptures, they looked and they said, their eyes were open, and it was a learning session. And when Jesus got in that boat, they said, you're him. You're him. We thought maybe. We ask you. But, but we know you're him. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the one that's coming. And my eyes have been opened now, and I realize that you're doing something bigger than what I thought. I thought you were coming to set up an army and a kingdom and free us from Roman. But you're doing something bigger. Their eyes were opened and realized, this guy's not defeating the Romans. This guy's defeating death. He's doing something greater than defeating Romans. He's defeating death. God's always doing something bigger than we think he can. Hey, New Life, it's 3 a.m. It's 3 a.m. right here, New Life. And here we are. And we've got the option. And we've got the choice. It's 3 a.m. And we're on the sea. And we've got the choice to make. Just as they had a choice. See, they could have been like, oh, no, it's a ghost. It's too scary to move forward. I'm too nervous to move forward. I, I don't see exactly how this is going to end. I can't see the ending, so shh, just sit here, and maybe he'll pass us by. But that's not what happened. The ones in the boat looked and they went, no, 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 no. That's not a ghost. That's him. That's God. That's Jesus. That's the Messiah. That's the Christ. That's our salvation. That's the sacrificial lamb that's going to pay for all sins once and for all. It's him. Get him in the boat. We want him in the boat with us. Because up to this point, he could provide for us but he could not reside with us. And now, he's not just a provider. 
He's here. He's right here. We just talked about it. And so it's 3 a.m., New Life. And we've got a decision to make. To roll into this next season. To roll into this new season. Nervous and scared and creeping down in the boat and going, shh, maybe he'll pass us by. Or we can stand up and go, he said we're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. He said it. We're doing it. We can keep our dreams and our vision small. We can go, not only are we putting a campus at the Legacy property, that's going to be the next greatest high school in Chilton County. New Life Community High School. Not only are we doing that, we're putting campus in Selma, Montevallo, Calera. We're not going to limit him. When I get to heaven, I had a dream once. I had a dream I got to heaven, and we were walking down the hallway, and Jesus was opening the door, and I looked in there. It was, it was a room full of shells, kind of like Granny would put, like, mason jars, you know, like the canned tomatoes on there. And I looked in there, and there was all these jars empty and all these jars that were full. And I said, hey, Jesus, what's, what's going on here? What's the difference in the full jars and the empty jars? And Jesus said, David, all those full jars are all the prayers that you didn't believe me for. So I left them there. And so when I woke up, <laughs> I told Tara, my jars are going to be empty. When I get up there, he may go, boy, you push me limits. You know it? You just about asked for too much. But he's not going to open that door, and I have a bunch of full jars in there. I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to empty my blessing. Whatever he wants from me, when we get up there and have a talk, and go, hey, you said I could do all things through you. That's your fault. It's not going to be I get up there and he goes, hey, David, who'd you bring with you? We do it who I brought with me. I barely got here myself. I was just trying to get me here. That's not going to happen. I'm going to get up there and he's going to say, how'd you get here? You, Jesus, I got here because of you. Who'd you bring with you? All these people. I know all these people. I know him. I know her. I know him. I know her. I'm going to empty the jars. And so I just encourage you, New Life, as we go into this next season, don't be scared. It's 3 a.m. and it's not a ghost. 